horse open sleigh or where the fields we go laughing all the way bells on bob to ring making spirits bright what fun it is to ride and sing the sleighing song tonight oh jingle bells jingle bells jingle all the way oh what fun it is to ride in one horse open sleigh Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in one horse open sleigh. Well, you are listening to Sean of the South, and I'm your host tonight, Sean Dietrich, coming to you live via the podcast, airwaves, and radio waves all over this fine nation. This episode brought to you by Case Knives, a tradition of my family dating back to my granddaddy, and by recording King Guitars, Touch History by playing an instrument from yesterday. And that music behind me is Aaron Peters on a biscuit box fiddle. open sleigh jingle bells jingle bells jingle all the way oh what fun it is to ride in one horse open sleigh also with me tonight is sean smucker award-winning author of light from distant stars and these nameless things he lives in lancaster pennsylvania with his wife and six children we're going to be talking about just life in general and, and what Christmas might have been like up there in his part of the woods. Aaron, why don't you save us from this monologue and play us a solo? Open slick, my God! Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. I've heard better. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh! Say it, come on! Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh boy! Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse! Oh my God! We sound like cats. Jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. I say, oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. <laughs> oh, my goodness, don't quit your day job. Uh, gee whiz, I thought, uh, I thought we could at least handle the singing a little bit better than that. But apparently not. Well, tonight's kind of special. We're doing four podcasts this season for Christmas. Uh, We took a break after COVID era uh, landed on everybody and the pandemic gave everybody a stiff case of the COVID era blues and somebody lost their job and then other people lost their jobs. So they just didn't make a whole lot of sense to force uh, extra work when people were trying to find other more important work. So we've been on sabbatical and actually it's been quite nice we kept we've had our podcast going for i believe three years now i could be misspeaking but i think it's three years and we uh a break is good Uh, at least it was good for me but for christmas we got a lot of emails because we we put on a lot you know christmas shows in the past and we had a lot of enthusiastic listeners i think our listener count was up to 12 yeah, 12, I think, last year. So we've had at least 12 emails from people asking us to put out Christmas shows, and that's what this is. We're doing four Christmas shows, one of which is going to be very, very special. And I don't even want to tell you what it is, and I hope that you're able to, to wait to listen to it until Christmas Eve night. That's actually what we're going to title it. We're going to call it Don't Open Until Christmas Eve. Eve. Uh, that's all I will say about it. Uh, so please, if you uh, are you looking for something to, to cheer you up during this COVID era Christmas, look out for that one. We're going to be giving away five books from my friend, 
author Sean Smucker, award-winning author. The books are a fiction book named These Nameless Things. Sean Smucker is the real deal. I met him in Louisiana when we were serving on a book forum or panel uh, for a question and answer forum at a big book event in Baton Rouge. And he uh, sat to my right and another author sat to my left or no, maybe they both sat to my right. Yeah, they both sat to my right, and i got to get these things right. And he saved me from monologue suicide, because whenever anybody would ask me a question about, you know, theme development or plot or character, you know, analyzation or my writing process or whatever, uh, the the fool in me came out and had no idea how to answer these things, so I looked at them like a possum in headlights, and Sean would just pick up the ball and run with it and he would he would make me feel like less of a fool and you'd never even know sitting on that book panel that I had failed the fifth grade which is true I actually did fail the fifth grade uh, this book is called These Nameless Things. We're giving away five of them. At the end of this podcast, we are giving away five books, one book to each email we get first. So send us an email whenever you finish with this podcast or right now while you're listening to this podcast at Sean of the South Show at gmail.com or you can look us up at Sean of the South Show dot com. And uh, be sure to send us your letters about anything. Uh, I'm going to read you a little note about Sean Smucker's book, uh, These Nameless Things, that he wrote. He says, I have always found Dante's Inferno intriguing, and as soon as I imagined that it might be possible to escape from it, These Nameless Things was born. I thought about Dan and Adam, the characters in this book, for many years, from around 2011 to 2018, before being able to finally wrap my mind around the story. And really, what a story it is. If you have read Dante's Inferno, doubtless you recognize things in this book. The signpost at the entrance of a mountain, the vision of a leopard, the lion and a wolf. I won't read you any more to give away the plot. What I will tell you is that this is something you want to read. There's a lot of symbolism in this, and it will bless your heart to put it in the phrase and dialect of my people, as opposed to the dialect of Sean's people in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, before we talk to him, we're going to sing you a Christmas song because it just doesn't feel like Christmas without singing a Christmas song. When I was a seeker, I sought both night and day. I asked the Lord to help me, and he showed me the way. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Go tell it on the mountain. That Jesus Christ is born. Come on, air. He made me a watchman upon that city wall. And if I am a good man, I am least of all. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Come on. Silent flocks by night Angels 
rang out a chorus that gave them boys delight. Go till it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go till it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. While Mary sat with Joseph in that manger stall. Was born a little baby, the king of all. Go till it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go till it on the mountain, that Jesus Christ is born. Come on in. listening to Sean of the South. I'm your host, Sean Dietrich, the uh, beloved misguided soul in this world who has somehow (laughs) managed to find another Sean in this universe, a Sean who writes beautiful prose and also manages to to make me laugh because we just went through about, uh, I don't know, five minutes worth of technological failures. (laughs) (laughs) And I told him that uh, for me, it's always it's always a uh, technological failure. I'm always failing at, at everything where electricity is involved. And I, I usually, my wife calls this the Sean equation. And it occurred to me that uh, this was Sean squared. <laughs> Sean of the North. <laughs> that's right. And that's how we got introduced. That's, what, that's how you introduced yourself to me. Yeah. So uh, this, is a, this is really a pleasure for me to have you talking with me today because I really respect you not just as as an author and and a great writer I really respect how you handle yourself in a world of blatant self-promotion and shameless uh, narcissism if I have to say it <laughs> and you don't seem to go in for any of that how do you manage to uh, to stave off the anxiety that fuels a lot of that uh, that blatant you know narcissism that's really kind of you sean um my i I don't know my publisher might wish i was a little more more narcissistic um (laughs) i don't know man i i think i've always hoped that the work would speak for itself you know and i i know we have to do promotion and i know we got to work hard to get to get word of, of our work out into the world. And so, I, you know, it's not that I don't do that. Um, but at the end of the day, I do feel like there's a part of me that's able to let it go and just hope that what I've created is good enough for somebody to tell their friends, Hey, you got to read this, you know, like I really enjoyed this book and I I'd rather work harder at writing and I still have a long way to go and a lot to learn. And I, I, I just want to get better at writing. So I hope that, um, that that's enough. Uh, social media has kind of, for me, turned into something that's kind of cringeworthy to look at. Uh, I see a lot of mainly authors, <laughs> but other creatives uh, <laughs> who are they're they're just shameless about it. They're it, they're not even sharing their real life anymore. They're just sharing products, yeah. and you you manage to share real life. I I like that. I really do. Yeah, I think that's definitely part of it. You know, I think that's part of it, and. My wife is always sort of checking me. Um, she's like, you're, you're not just posting good stuff, are you? You know, like, like I don't want people to think everything's perfect around here. I love that. <laughs> oh, man, I really love that. I, well, the, uh, we had said something, you and I, earlier. I wanted to kind of follow up on that about social media. 
I have really been trying myself since this pandemic hit to scale back uh, from from for me personally, kind of cell phone addiction, if I can call it that, or uh, screen time addiction. Uh, mm. And you said that maybe you were doing some of that yourself. Tell me how that happened. Yeah, I you know I I feel the same way. I have a I, I'm kind of this this dangerous combination, I guess, of, um, of a procrastinator and a, uh, highly addictive personality. So if there's anything that I can do, that's going to help me to put off the work and it's kind of mindless, um, it, it's something that I'm probably going to get involved in. And, and social media has been difficult for me in that way. I'm, I'm definitely someone who is very happy to think, Oh, I'm stuck in my work. I'm going to hop on Facebook and scroll, or I'm going to hop on Instagram and scroll for the next, you know, I, I tell myself next two minutes and then 30 minutes later, you know, time just flies. Mm. So I have a friend, his name's Ed Sezeski. He wrote a book called Reconnect and he and I talk a lot about social media and the positives and negatives and something that he had pointed out to me was this app that he used called Freedom, which uh, you can put on your computer, your phone, and you basically set times when you let yourself um, – you know, when you can get into certain websites that you wouldn't normally, uh, that you don't want to spend all day on. So, um, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all those on my computer, I have windows throughout the day, um, short windows that I can check in, but it definitely helps keep the scrolling to a minimum. And I found that as I start to cut back, I actually just desire to be on the spaces less. Um, so that's been one of the that's been really interesting. Yeah, it's it's kind of like the more you're on there, the more you want to be on there. But the reverse is actually true as well. I start to feel like I'm just kind of losing touch with 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 that side of life and it, and it becomes less and less interesting. So that's been really helpful. And it's also really funny because this this particular app Freedom when you uh when your time is up and you're you're being shut out of all these websites that you've told them you want to be shut out of. This little green screen comes up and it says, "You are now free to live your life." That's great. <laughs> that is great. Uh, really cool. Let me ask you this: What are you doing for Christmas? How, how, what's Christmas look like up there? What part of Pennsylvania you live in? We're in Lancaster. Lancaster. So um, yeah, over towards Philadelphia, about an hour and a half drive west of Philadelphia. Um, pandemic's been hitting hard up there it has been yeah it has been um christmas is going to be tough i'm not really sure my my wife miley and i have been talking about it with the kids recently the last few years what we've done for christmas is we we kind of started to move away from gifts um just because okay so we have six kids and we've been buying toys wow. you know for our oldest is 17. So we've been buying toys for 17 years. Nobody needs any more toys in this house. There are, <laughs> we've got bins full of Legos. We've got video games falling out of the cabinet. Like nobody needs any, any more entertaining. And so a few years ago we decided that we were going to, instead of buying big gifts for everyone, we still did stockings and got like little tiny stuff. But instead of doing big gifts, we decided to go on a trip. So the first year um, we saved up all our present money and went to New York City um, for, I think it was for two nights. And we saw a show and the kids loved it. I mean, it was a huge hit. So uh, the next year, I think we went to, no, the next year we did 12 nights of Christmas. So we just did fun activities for 12 days after Christmas. Went out to eat, went to the movies, that sort of thing. Last year we went to Pittsburgh. I think that was last year. Um, and... Man, we're, we don't want to do the big, huge gift thing again. We'd like to do the experiences, but we're kind of drawing a blank as far as what we're even able to do these days. Yeah. I mean, it's... It's cold up there, right? It is cold, but it's... I mean, unless you get really, really bad weather, it's still doable to go outside for the day or go hiking or yeah. um, find stuff like that. So that's one thing that we'll definitely do. We're um, We're also huge into games, so... You know, as a family, I think we'll probably just try and spend some real concentrated family time over the days after Christmas. Although, I mean, goodness, we've been in concentrated family time now for eight months, so I don't wow. know how much the kids are going to be into that. <laughs> <laughs> what does your uh, daily life look like, pandemic style, since you have such a heavy uh, kid household? Yeah, well, our oldest 
three are doing school online. So we've got a junior, a sophomore in high school, and then um, an, a seventh grader. So they're online, fully online, and they're pretty much taking care of themselves. Miley doesn't have to do very much with them. They just kind of, you know, check onto their screen for the day and and do their school. Then our fourth grade, or sorry, fifth grader, is in school two days a week. So he's back and forth. Um, I normally get up with everybody in the morning. So I wake up with our two youngest, who are six and four. I get up with them usually about six thirty. Um, well, we've taught them to read the clock, so they wake up at like 5.30 and come into the room, and then we're like, no, you go look at your clock. When it's 6.30, you can come wake me up. So then they go play in the room for a while. <laughs> then I get breakfast with them. Um, Miley sort of takes over about 8 o'clock, and that's when I go down to my, my study in the, in the basement and just start work. Um, this year's actually been really busy for me. I've been writing books for other people. A couple of memoirs, a couple of books for organizations who are trying to get their message out, um, and that's that's what I do. So, I, you know, I mean, you can't really write all day. I mean, at least I can't. My brain gets fried. So, usually by two, three o'clock, I'm kind of wrapping things up, maybe read for a while, um, and then head upstairs around three or four. Um, let me ask you this: Have you noticed, just in Lancaster or? Uh on the internet or in your own personal life, have you noticed a uh, an up uh, an uptick in you know negativity, maybe anger, anything like that? Oh yeah, yeah. I'm. It's it's really interesting, especially here in Lancaster. We live in the city. It's a it's a really small city, about sixty thousand people in the center of the county, and you know, generally speaking, the viewpoints of the people who live in the city here um, are very different than the viewpoints of the people who live, you know, literally three miles away out in, in farm country. Um, and so because, because it's in so such close proximity and because everybody's concerns really are very tied together as far as the prosperity of the County and, and how things are going to move forward. There's been a lot of that in, in our area. Mm-hmm. Um, especially with the election and, and all that, it's really, it's tough. You know, I've, why do you think, I know, let me ask you, why do you uh, think that is? Why do you think the, the rise, any ideas being a literary mind like you are? Well, I, I think a lot of it comes back to social media. You know, I think a lot of, a lot of us, um, if you spend any amount of time on social media, you are being fed information that lines up with what you believe and drives you further into that space. So, Mm. you know, if, if, if you think that the poodle is the best dog in the world, like you will be getting articles in your newsfeed about how amazing (laughs) poodles are. And I love it. Do you know what I'm saying? Like I'm everything surprised. That, I thought all this time the poodle really was. <laughs> <laughs> everything that you love, Sean, is going to be reinforced by social media. And everything that you hate is going to be made worse and worse and worse wow. by social media. And so because we're all on social media, it is literally driving us in, in opposite directions. I mean, that that is the only thing that I can... The only thing that I can think of that that has caused this, because if you look, you know, 20 years ago, liberals and conservatives weren't best friends. But um, I just I don't remember the vitriol and the and the actual hatred, the contempt that that people now feel for each other. Um, I don't remember that. It just seems so widespread and so pervasive. And I can't help but believe that. It's because like every day we spend hours on these screens and they just make us feel more and more secure in our own beliefs and they totally eliminate any sort of desire to get to know the person on the other side, to get to know why someone believes what they do. No matter how – I mean you know, I'm not saying that that there aren't rights and wrongs. I'm not saying there aren't things that you should do and things you shouldn't do. But behind those actions, there's always a person and there's always a reason that they're doing what they're doing. 
And social media takes away any motivation to get to know that person. And that's well said. That's well said. Uh, uh, speaking of memories, yes. what, what was yeah. Christmas like for you? You grew up in Lancaster, I guess, right? Yeah, I grew up out in the country. So uh, my parents rented half of a farmhouse for about five years, which really are the earliest memories that I have. Uh, my dad wasn't a farmer, but there was a, you know, half of a farmhouse was available to rent. So we lived there. And man, I have such wonderful memories of of waking up Christmas. Well, Christmas Eve, we would always go to my grandma's house, uh, my mom's mom, and my cousins would be there and my aunts and uncles would be there. And they would play all kinds of games and not let the kids play. So we'd sulk and go off and do our own thing. And the men would always play Monopoly. It was like this tradition. My grandfather and the two brothers and the two in-law boys would would always play monopoly and us kids oh my gosh we begged and pleaded and begged and we were never allowed to play so but we still had a wonderful night i mean we had a great time and then we would drive home from grandma's i would you know we'd fall asleep in the in the vehicle on the way home because we'd leave so late and the heat would be blasting in the car and we'd sort of stumble our way into bed wake up christmas morning i specifically remember one christmas my parents bought me one of those old race tracks, one of those old car race tracks, and I played on that thing all day, and that became a Christmas tradition for many years. As I would set up the race track Christmas morning, um, and because we lived in the farmhouse, it was like there were so many fun things to do. There was a creek about you know four or five hundred yards away that uh, me and this Amish friend of mine would go down and play and. It was it was a really wonderful place to grow up. An Amish friend of yours. <laughs> well, my parents both grew up Amish, um, and and their parents left the Amish when they were kids. So I still have a lot of Amish relatives, um, second, third cousins, great uncles, that sort of thing. Well, what's that um, like? But, uh, do you ever rejoin their festivities at all? As yeah, yeah, we do. Really? Yeah, we do. Um, I grew up going to family reunions and. On my mom's side, a ton of the people at the family reunion would be Amish. Um, I worked in farmer's markets were some of the earliest jobs that I had. And, you know, so I was working around Amish folks. A lot of them were my relatives. Um, my great-grandmother lived to be in her 90s, and she was Amish up until the day she died. And she lived with my parents one month. Like, so what? it's interesting what they do in the Amish when they get old, um, you know, they don't, they don't send them to retirement homes. They, they basically, all the kids just take turns with them. So they'll, they'll create a little space in the house. And then, um, so for, for us, we called her mummy, great grandma. She would spend a month with each of her kids. And because my grandmother lived with my parents, she would spend a month with us, um, as she sort of made her way around from house to house. And so I, yeah, I don't know. I, I grew up really appreciating the Amish a lot. Um, no kidding. It's a, it is a very, um, it's funny because a lot of people get hung up on the, on the shunning thing and think, wow, they must be ruthless, you know, if they're, if they're willing to shun their family who leave the Amish or whatever. But it's, in my experience, it's a very kind community, very welcoming, very eager to, to just to talk and to engage with you and things like that. They're really very kind for the most part. Um, so how did that influence you as a writer? That, that That's tradition. a good question. You know, well, you know, coming out of that tradition, especially um, one of the negatives I would say is that because it's such a, it's such a strong community that, um, that it doesn't lend itself to individual acts or individuals standing out. So hmm. you don't tend to see a lot of like the arts encouraged among the Amish. You have your occasional Amish, very creative person who becomes an artist, but it's very, very unusual. Um, they read a lot, so they would tend they would read fiction and read books. Really, but but yeah, but but as far as like being a writer, that wouldn't be something that you'd be encouraged, I don't think, to pursue as an Amish as an Amish kid. And so I think there was some of that, that sort of trickled down into my family. I mean, my parents have always been very encouraging of me. Um, but I think just sort of more along the lines of the general community, 
you don't really want to do anything to stand out um, because it's sort of seen as prideful. You just it's really encouraged that you you sort of you know know your place, um, do the work that you need to do to be part of the community, but don't do anything that's going to make you stand out. Hmm. I mean, I, I feel like maybe the world could do with a little bit of that right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> which might might explain a lot about your your view on life, which I admire. Uh, you were telling the Christmas memory before I so viciously interrupted you. Oh, uh, yeah, no. So they're playing games. They're playing Monopoly and Scrabble. Y'all want to play, but you can't do it. They're not They're not encouraging that. You drive home, heater's blasting, you're in the back. What else? What other traditions? Did you have a tree and presents, or was that not something that the Amish uh, tradition kind of welcomed? Or Yeah, we had a tree. Um, we definitely had a tree and, and presents for sure. I mean, our Christmas looked pretty much like anyone else's. Um, my my dad was in the ministry, so he, he was a pastor for as long as I could remember. So he was never really making much money. Um, my mom would, uh, they call it binding quilts. So she would do yeah. the edges around a quilt. Um, and that's how she made extra money to buy us clothes for school and, and to buy Christmas presents. So a lot of the extras that we had in life were because my mom every night, like if we sat down to watch the TV, like I grew up watching the Cosby show and a uh, different world and family ties and that sort of thing. So if we were sitting around watching TV together as a family, my mom would always have a quilt on her lap and she would just be working away buying her quilts while she watched TV every night. Oh, you're, you're speaking my song here. That's my mother did the same <laughs> thing. The times that I had, that we have traveled, you know, in, in the mid Atlantic, I guess that's what you would be, huh? The mid Atlantic or the Northeast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mid Atlantic. Yeah. It is so different. It is so different. And, and like, uh, just to give you, for instance, we were in Pittsburgh and, uh, I, I'm used to holding the door open for people. Uh, it's just kind of a reflex. And yeah. uh, I went to go rush to open the door for somebody coming in. It was like a little elderly lady. I held the door open. She walked through and didn't even really acknowledge me, eye contact or say anything. And the next thing that happened was another group of people walked through the door. Same thing, didn't really acknowledge that I was even there. And then another group of people knocked, walked through the door. About oh, no. about 700 people later, I was still standing there opening the door. <laughs> they probably thought you weren't there. <laughs> That's yeah. I think they thought I was the doorman. <laughs> but it's not, and I don't mean to draw any division lines here at all, really. What I'm saying is it's their cultural differences that are so fine and so small, but they're they're really fascinating to me. Uh, oh, it's so different. It's so different, Sean. My, my in-laws lived in Charlotte for many years. They just recently moved to East Tennessee, but we would go down for Thanksgiving usually to spend time with them in Charlotte. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd find a coffee shop where I could work during the week before Thanksgiving, do some writing, and I would sit down and these people would just keep talking to me. Like <laughs> <laughs> the people sitting at the table next to me, they, oh, hey, where are you from? You know, what are you doing here? And I'm just thinking, I just want to get some work done. <laughs> <laughs> See, because uh, we were, you know, we just were up there, and and uh, one of the things we would say to each other, my wife and I, almost every night, would be like, "God, nobody wants to talk to." Us. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want to. Awesome. They think we're just, you know, they they we are though. We're we're loud, my wife and I. But uh, I'm sorry, man. I keep interrupting you. I really do want to know what Christmas was like in Pennsylvania. No, no, that's. I mean, but it is. That's that's such a such an interesting cultural difference, and it. I think, you know, the people coming through the door um, probably figured, you know, according to our culture, well, we don't really want to small talk or we'll just, you know, make him feel comfortable by not talking. Whereas yeah. the people down south, when I sit at a table, they're thinking, <laughs> oh, hey, well, if we don't talk to this guy, that'd be rude, you know, just to sit this close and not say anything. <laughs> <laughs> Unforgivable, actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, but no, Christmas, I mean, it was... I I had I really did have a remarkable childhood. It was it was a special special time and I I try not to take it for granted, you know. I really do because I know 
I know a lot of people in the world don't get that, but I, I had such a loving home and parents such are a wonderful, living, or are they? Yeah. My parents are, are still, my parents are very young. They, they had me when they were 20. So, hmm. um, they're, they're, my dad is 64 and my mom's 64. Um, so they're, yeah, they've always been on the young side and, um, yeah, I just, I had a, I had a great time growing up where I did. Hmm. So what does the future hold for for the uh, Smucker family? This pandemic thing is, I don't know, it just feels like everything has kind of come to a grinding halt. But then there are some things that you can't stop, you know, like the kids going from grade to grade and getting older and and getting into new stuff. And um, our son started working, oh, about a year ago, I guess, at Chick-fil-A a year and a half ago. And so boy, between work and he has his license and his friends, we don't really see him that much anymore. It really feels like our family is in the middle of, of a big transition where, you know, we kind of quote unquote are, are going to start to lose the older two. Mm. Not that it's a bad thing. You know I mean? It's, it's time for them to, to start branching out, but it well, does now, I'm feel. Not a, a, I'm not a parent. So this kind of really gets me interested. Does that hurt when that happens? It, it does and and yet it just feels so natural and necessary that there's nothing to be done about it you know like um our older son is hardly ever home for dinner anymore and that's that's always been a big deal for us like we really do try and eat dinner most nights a week together um but he's he's at work you know three four nights a week um our daughter is still with us but you know that's for a limited time i'm sure and uh, we've got the four below four younger than them. So they'll be around for a little while yet, but it's, you know, things are always changing and, um, soon we'll be at the stage where everybody will be in school. So that'll be, that'll be different. It, it definitely marks the time, um, you know, having the kids around, it's, it, it does seem to, to make the passing of time a little bit more, a little bit more obvious. So it makes this coming Christmas maybe feel a little bit more important than normal since people are. Yeah. You know, it really does. It really does. We were, we were even feeling that way about Thanksgiving, you know, with our son, just feeling like, wow, this is, this is probably one of the last Thanksgivings that we're going to have, uh, where he's around all week and, you know, um, with us throughout all of Thanksgiving day. And, and those things are going to start to change soon. Mm. So tell me, what will you do when you're an empty nester? Man, I will <laughs> keep doing what I'm doing. <laughs> I just, I, you know, Sean, I feel like I said about my childhood, I feel so blessed right now that I get to write every day. I know so many people who wish that they could do that. And I'm not saying that it's easy all the time or that it's even always enjoyable, but I do appreciate that I every morning, you know, at eight o'clock, hand off the kids and come down to my desk and get to do what I love, even for other people, even to help other people write books. So it's just such a huge blessing. And if I can keep doing this for the next 20, 30, 40 years, I'll be a happy man. I just love that. How long have you been married? You've been married a lot, a while, it sounds like. We've been married about, uh, let's see, 20, 21 years. How about you guys? Uh, we're coming up on our 18th. <laughs> okay, nice. But I got married when I was just out of the crib, so <laughs> <laughs> really, I was only thirteen years old when we got married. In case anybody's curious about me out there, <laughs> uh, what is it like hanging out with your mom and dad? Yeah, um, my mom is just such a hard worker. She she's sixty four and she has she owns a mar a farmers market stand uh, that she works at. You know, three four days a week. And she's got 15 grandkids between the four, the four kids, four of us kids. So she's always having kids over to her house during the day or babysitting. Um, I mean, she just goes nonstop. And I'm, I, I do often tell her she needs to take it easy. She's not getting any younger. But she just – that's – I think that's the Amish influence on her. I mean, just – you just work and work and that's what life is, working. And, and it's, it's actually really enjoyable to them. Um, my dad was, I mean, he was great when I was a kid. I was the only boy in the family. So I think I got a little bit special treatment. Um, hmm. we, we, I grew up through throwing base, throwing baseball with him 
actually my earliest memory is we lived in a in a trailer in southern texas in laredo texas wow when he got his very first job as a preacher and he took a church down on the on the mexico texas border and i remember i was probably 3 or 4 years old but i remember in that trailer he would throw football with me um and the and and we had a different number for each route that I would run. So, you know, a one meant if he said one, I would just go straight down the hallway and then he'd throw it to me. And a two, I would just go short and he'd throw me a short pass. And a three, I would go out and then turn to the left. And a four, I would go out and turn to the right. And he would just call plays and mm-hmm. my little four-year-old legs would just go and go and go. And he threw football with me. I mean, I just have such strong memories of that. And then once we moved to Pennsylvania, even as a five, six-year-old kid, whenever we moved back, I can't remember exactly how old I was, but I felt this strong, such a strong sense that we were moving home. Even though I didn't remember it, I just knew because now I had cousins everywhere and uncles and aunts everywhere. And my dad would throw baseball with me out in the yard I mean, Hmm. I must have been such a pain in his butt, honestly. (laughs) (laughs) I think I probably asked him to throw ball every single day and he, and he really did. I think, I mean, in my memory, he threw ball with me like every day. I don't know if that's, if that's actually the case or not, but that's how I remember it. So you're a Steeler and Pirates fan, I guess. I'm a a Steelers fan and a Phillies fan. (laughs) So there aren't a lot of those around, um, we're actually a lot closer to Philadelphia, so there. This would mostly be Eagles territory. I see. I see. Um, but yeah, so so he um, and he was a he was a preacher. So I grew up. And what denomination uh, was that? Uh, well, it was, it was non-denominational when I was a kid. It was very charismatic Pentecostal. Um, yeah. So man, we were we were going to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I mean you know, special services throughout the week. That was like, that was, that was my life, which I didn't mind because I had four or five really close friends who were my age at the church. So I was, I was totally fine to go. I didn't want to sit in a service, but I was fine to go to church. And then we would sneak out and run around outside and, you know, have a blast. Are your parents proud of you? Yeah. Yeah, they are. They are. Well, I am too, even though I'm your junior and I have not even close to the uh, perspective on life that you do. But I do want you to know that I admire you and I want everybody out there to know that they can find him. And this is your turn, Sean, to tell us where the heck we can find you. Yeah, sure. Well, I've got a website, seansmucker.com, S-H-A-W-N, smucker.com. Uh, my wife Miley and I do a podcast called The Stories Between Us, where we talk about family, writing. Miley's a writer as well, so we talk about family and writing and creativity, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, that's that's it. And and I love connecting with people. So, you know, if you, if you do head to the website, just click the contact button, send me an email. I'd love to hear from you. Well, I do want to say thanks to Sean Smoker for being on our show. He could have been doing anything else better with his life tonight than to be with us, but he chose to uh, to talk to me. He's a good man, and if you'd like to read anything more from him, you can visit SeanSmucker.com, like he said, S-H-A-W-N-S-M-U-C-K-E-R. Or you can buy his books at any online bookseller, or if you really want to get a copy, signed, you can email me at SeanOfTheSouthShow.com where coincidentally you can find archived episodes of our show dating back to our first episode all the way to this episode which you just heard though I don't know why you must have terrible taste in podcasts if you'd like a copy of the book just tell me about it the first five emails I receive will get a signed copy of These Nameless Things by Sean Smucker signed, personalized, all that good stuff and I think it'll in, in the words of the dialect from the region that I'm from, I think it will bless your heart. Actually, I know it will. Uh, if you'd like to find anything more about what we do, you can find us at the address I just told you about, or you can just Google us. And I hope when you're there, you take the time to drop me a line, tell me about your birthday announcement, when the invitations, and potluck socials. And I will do my best to talk about them on the air 
or at least to read them. And if you're struggling this year with the black snake of depression, I hope you don't hesitate to send me a message. I might not be able to answer every single email I get, but I promise you this, I will read them. And me reading your words will mean that you are not alone because you are not alone this year. I hope you have a very merry, merry Christmas. Adios. Adios.